All right, welcome back. Now, the Supreme Court recently declared that spouses are not automatically entitled to 50% share of matrimonial property upon divorce. Well, this may have settled one of the contentious issues in the country's family law, but what are the implications? Allow me to introduce my two guests who are joining me virtually as we unpack uh, all of this. We have Judy Dongori, the family lawyer, and Sheikh Sukyan, who is the acting chief caddy. Thank you both for joining me this evening. I hope I'm audible on your end. Uh, let me begin with uh, you, Judy, uh, just to kind of plainly lay out what the Supreme Court actually ruled on. Because the one headline we saw in the media after that ruling was no more 50-50. But what does that essentially mean? Um, Victoria, um, thank you for having me. But first of all, there never was 50-50. But what the Supreme Court did was to clarify that the constitutional provision that provides that uh, spouses have equal rights at the entry of the marriage, during the marriage, and after the marriage does not mean that they have equal, they have automatic um, equal property rights. Okay, so the Supreme Court also uh, clarified that for all the cases that were filed before the Matrimonial Property Act of 2013, that became effective from the 16th of January 2014, the law applicable was the English Act that was there before. And that in that English Act, the only contribution that was recognized for purposes of matrimonial property was direct and indirect financial um, uh, contribution. Okay. It also clarified about the presumption of marriage that while parties uh, can cohabit together, not all cohabit co cohabiting situations amount to a marriage under the law. And the Supreme Court gave us the parameters that have to be met by couples for them to qualify as married, even though not having gone through any formal, um, any formal marriage, in a nutshell. So, Judy, let me uh, dig into something that you just talked about, the direct and indirect contributions. And there are a lot of questions, especially on social media, people asking, how do you quantify, for instance, uh, indirect or non-material contributions? Okay, so, um, Victoria, so before 2013 December, before 2014, uh, 16th of January, when this act became law, uh, the indirect contribution meant that you're putting in financial contribution into a family's, um, into a family, like for example, you're paying school fees, you're buying food, you're buying clothes, you're paying utilities, while the other person is paying directly into the acquisition or development of a property. So indirect is that which is going into other aspects of the family life, and direct is the one that's going directly into the purchase or development of a property. So Judy, would this mean that people have to keep uh, tabs, receipts, paper trails of what they've contributed? Uh, should it get to divorce? How would they show proof of contribution? Indeed. It is important. So uh, before 2014 January, yes, you absolutely had to keep uh, evidence of financial contribution, whether direct or indirect. But after the Matrimonial Property Act became law, it recognized that you can have both monetary or financial and non-financial contribution. It recognized that uh, child, ch uh, child care is part of contribution, companionship is part of contribution, domestic work is part of contribution, working in a family business, a farm work, and all that. So apart from financial contribution, whether direct or indirect, that other non-financial contribution is now recognized from the year 2014 January. Victoria, allow me to clarify very quickly and to let um, Kenyans know that for those who filed their cases in court before 16th of January 2014, the act that applies to them is that old English act, and therefore their cases will be measured, their contribution will be measured on whether it was financial 
direct or indirect. But for those who have filed their cases after the 16th of January 2014, their contribution will be measured on whether it is financial or whether it's non-financial in the categories that I have given you. Okay, let me come to Sheikh Sukian just to get your take on the ruling. Uh, what did you make of it? And what are the implications, for instance, on divorces that happen within the Muslim community? Uh, thank you so much, Victoria, for having me on board. Uh, the decision of the Superior Court on, on uh, equal distribution of matrimonial property does not have much effect, on, in my view, on uh, Muslims. The reason being is that uh, Muslims have been exempted from the operation of uh, the act itself uh, in as much as it conflicts with Muslim law. The law applicable to uh, Muslims in this country uh, upon the um, uh, divorce or the death is the Muslim law. And the Muslim law recognizes the ownership or the property rights of property uh, regardless of uh, the relationship between the husband and the wife. Therefore, within the marriage, both the spouse can have a distinct ownership of a property they can acquire and possess the property. So the property that my wife acquires on her own or with my support then becomes her own property while mine that acquire becomes my own property. If we acquire together again, then we'll be having the properties together. That is the consideration that the Muslim Islamic Muslim law put in place. Sheikh, we've seen uh, an increase, a steady increase of divorces across the board in Kenya. Um, and this, of course, has not spared the Muslim community. You know, talk to us about what some of the contributing factors have been. Uh, it's true that there's a rise in, uh, uh, in a divorce. And what is normally reported is what is being taken in court or maybe the divorces at which are registered. Perhaps what is not being reported is more than uh, what is being reported. That's what my, I assume. And, uh, and uh, of course, there are so many factors, so many factors that, uh, in my view, contribute to this uh, high prevalence of the divorce in our country, not a Muslim, not a non-Muslim. And, and one of the factors, of course, um, in my view, is the social media problem. Social media really contribute a lot, in my view, uh, to the divorce, if it is used in a negative, in a negative manner. And also, it is responsibility of the spouses or the couples. Okay, this also uh, towards the uh, the marital responsibilities. It's also other other factors. For us as a Muslim, uh, there is a duty that each and every. Uh, uh, of the uh, married uh, uh, people should perform. For example, the husband is required to provide for the families, to, pro to provide full security of the family. So the moment that he fails to do that, then this uh, have an effect on it. At the same time, also, we have big problem as Muslims. Remember that Muslims marriage, Islamic marriage is a polygamous. So polygamy also is a contributing factor. Um, Judy, Good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sheikh. Judy, let me uh, bring you in here because <coughs> the ruling had been viewed as a deterrent of sorts for those who haven't gotten into marriage yet. And, you know, you could see some people saying this will scare away what we call gold diggers, uh, people who tend to social climb through marriage. But um, what is the place of, and I know prenups are not necessarily recognized in Kenya, but how do people with significant amounts of assets protect themselves, for instance, before they get into marriage, and if a divorce happens? Um, okay, you know, <laughs> Victoria, marriage is for better or for worse, so <laughs> I am hoping that they wouldn't have to protect themselves from their spouses. But having said that, the matrimonial property allows for uh, postnuptials in Kenya, uh, prenuptials, sorry, prenuptials. So 
parties, people who are about to get married, are at, li at liberty to get into prenuptial agreements. But you know, the problem is actually not the law. I have had this conversation many times with the, uh, many young people, and they tell me, but Judy, if I bring up a conversation of prenuptial, won't the other person think that um, our marriage is only going to be about property? And I tell them, no, I, I think those are things that you should have on the table. And in fact, the reason why many marriages are facing the difficulties they are is because people didn't have candid conversations about you know, money matters. But to answer your question, um, Victoria, it is provided for in the Matrimonial Property Act. And increasingly, we are seeing people getting into prenuptial agreements. And they are enforceable under the law. Uh, Sheikh, okay, but having said that, yes, go ahead, Judy. Sorry, my apologies. Yeah, I just want to clarify a few things that under our Matrimonial Property Act, and this applies to all people who come into to, to, to dispute or court after January 2014. I keep on emphasizing that because it is important. There are three categories of properties that I'd like to talk about. The first one is matrimonial property. Not every property that's acquired during marriage becomes matrimonial property. It is only the matrimonial home, household goods, and properties that are jointly registered between the spouses. Those three categories of properties have very special protection under the Act. Number one, you cannot sell without the consent of the other or leave of the court. Number two, you cannot evict your spouse from the matrimonial home without leave of the court. Number three, there is a presumption with respect to the matrimonial um, home and in household goods that even if it is registered in one spouse only, it is held in trust for the other. That's one category of properties. Mm -hmm. The other category of property is, is called separate property. The Matrimonial Property Act provides for that. That all other property that is not the matrimonial home, that is not the household goods, that is not property jointly, jointly registered between the couple, is separate property. And the person in whose name is it is registered is presumed to be the owner. But if the other spouse has made a contribution, that spouse is entitled to a share to the extent of their contribution. And the law father says that that category of property is not affected by the marriage. You can deal with it as you please, except to the extent that you'll account to the other spouse to the extent of their contribution. Victoria. Uh, let me ask a follow-up, uh, especially when it comes to the issue of can we stay uh, marriages and, and those arrangements. Of course, the court uh, ruled on that as well. But how do you go about child custody, uh, property and assets being divided if you're under such an arrangement? Okay, so uh, child custody, irrespective of whether there's a marriage between the parents of, of the child, uh, comes into being. Mm -hmm. The child, child custody is about the fact that uh, both parents have a child, not because they are married, not, not about whether they are married or not, okay? So even if spouses, even if parties are not married, but they have a child together, they are responsible for maintenance of the child and for participation physically and emotionally in the child's life. The same standards apply where a couple is married. What matters most is a child's best interest, and it doesn't matter that the couple is married or not married. Okay, cohabitation, okay, so when people live together and they have not gone through a formal ceremony, and if they invest in property together and they go to court, what we see is that one party says, we have been living together as husband and wife for this period of time, and the court should presume a marriage, okay, because we have held ourselves out as husband and wife, and we have invested together. If the other person comes and says that it was not a marriage, you live together as friends, or your boyfriend and girlfriend, even though you may have lived together for 50 years, it happens by the way, Victoria, mm -hmm. in the courts we are in, then it is up to you, who is asserting that there is a marriage, to prove that indeed there was one. And once you do prove that there was one, then the court will consider what contribution you made to the property, that is a family property, if you like, both matrimonial and separate property, 
and, and give um, an appropriate award. Now, in one of the cases, because there were two cases from the Supreme Court uh, the other Friday that came out of the Supreme Court uh, the other Friday, the court stated that there was no marriage between the man and the woman. The, the man is the one who was asserting that there was a marriage by come we stay or cohabitation. And then he was claiming that because of that marriage, he was entitled to a share of the property registered in the woman's name. But the court said that from the facts before it, there was no marriage, although there was long cohabitation, because mainly because the, the woman in this case had a pre-existing marriage. And as we don't have poly polyandry in this country, it is, she didn't have the capacity to get into a marriage with him. That notwithstanding, the court said that because he, it, there was evidence that he'd contributed, even though he was not a spouse, the court would settle the matrimonial property dispute and it gave him 30% and the woman got 70%. And he did say that it's time perhaps that parliament made law on cohabiti unions and their rights to property. Uh, Sheikh, uh, as we wrap, I want to get your view on this uh, when it comes to how property is split, especially in polygamous setups, because we know that is allowed and permissible within the Muslim community. How does that work? Uh, kindly unmute so we can hear you, Sheikh. Oh. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, please. Uh, Pardon me again, the question, please. Yes. Yeah, if you can take us through how the property division goes under Muslim law, especially in a polygamous setup, if uh, a wife wants to leave the marriage, how does that work? Well, uh, as I earlier said, the issue of the distribution of matrimonial property doesn't uh, uh, arise in, in, Islam, in, in, in Muslim community. The what is there is that uh, um, each and every person in the marriage is entitled to whatever that he or she has contributed. If they have come together, everybody should go with what he or she had uh, contributed. Uh, the only thing uh, which is exceptional is the household properties which are there. Mm -hmm. Household properties, uh, which is commonly used in the uh, matrimonial homes, this can be shared. How can it be shared? It is normally guided by the customs of the communities and the school of thought that we are relying on, or parties belong to. Therefore, most of the time, the household properties are left to the wife in the event that people divorce. So this is normally guided by the customs of the various communities that we, we have. But uh, some of, of, the, of the common uh, uh, household properties which are, are of a lot of value sometimes. Therefore, if um, the value is too big that a man perhaps maybe say that he cannot do without, then there's possibility that he might go with what he, he contributed. Right. But otherwise, otherwise, apart from that, the wife would have um, a good send-off upon the divorce, a good send-off. If the property belongs perhaps maybe only uh, as the set up is to the man, then the wife should be given a good send off so that she starts a good life after she leaves the marriage. The other things I wanted just to add is that uh, what is worrying, if you look at the uh, uh, interpre interpretation clause of uh, Maternal, Maternal Property Act 2, we have the contribution in form of uh, companionship, in form of uh, taking care of the child in form of uh, uh, managing or, uh, the family uh, business or the material properties. Mm. Those are some of the contributions that give it to us. The, what is not very clear for how long, the law doesn't say for how long should a spouse uh, who is entitled to this uh, uh, to material property, right, or the divisions equally, for how long should we determine? Because right. the law is vague on that. People may join for a few months, and then again separate. Okay. Right. Those are very yes. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Fascinating conversation there, Sheikh Sukian and Judy Dongori. Thank you so much for your time and your insights. Uh, and of course, this is generating quite a bit of conversation online as well. Uh, let's take a short break.